I did a piece of work with um, the, the design company that I work with, Participle, on diabetes in Bolton. Uh, Bolton has an absolutely exemplary approach to decentralised healthcare. They've created healthy living centres on all their estates to reach out to people, to try and connect with people who've got diabetes, and they've done a much better job than they used to do. They still don't reach 80% of diabetics in Bolton because the diabetics they need to reach don't think they're diabetic. So actually, they need to reach them in pubs, clubs, homes, schools, supermarkets. They won't come to a place called a healthy living centre because they don't think they're uh, unhealthy. So more and more, we have to think, how do you reach people out there, not encourage people into our institutions? How do you create solutions which are personalised, encourage people to participate in their delivery and creation, and which are increasingly preventative, which allow people to self-manage or to prevent conditions coming about in the first place? So what kind of organisations might we imagine then that the public sector will have to create in order to deal with this kind of world? I just want to give you two or three ideas. This is the, this is the most basic, this is my um, very high-tech visual aid. Um, <clears throat> this is a very, very crude way of thinking about it, um, but I, th I think it's quite helpful. Um, most of the way that we think about problems in the public sector is like uh, the yolk of an egg. And what we're trying to do, we've got these great yolks, they're called schools, hospitals, daycare centres, social services departments, and we've got to try and make them as personalised as possible and get more people into the yolk. Uh, and if we can work on the relationship between the white and the yolk, that's a good thing. But actually most of the problems are on the plate. So what we've got are eggs on plates. And most of the resources are in the yolk, and most of the problems are on the plate. And so what we're desperately trying to do is get the yolk to kind of open up to get more people in, whereas actually what we should be doing is getting more resources out here so that we're dealing with the problems where they are. And so whether you think about, this is the extended school, this is school tries to engage with parents and so on and so forth, but this is the 85% of time on the plate that kids spend outside school. So this is the health centre and the doctor. Um, average diabetic sees a doctor maybe 12 hours a year, 4,000 hours of self-management, which is on the plate. This is your recycling and rubbish collection. This is your carbon footprint in Barnet. So what are the kinds of solutions that will work on the plate not just in the yoke. Well, a different way of thinking about it. Another, just a quick rule of thumb. One of the biggest improvements in a public outcome over the last 20 years in British towns and cities has been the decline in deaths due to fires in domestic uh, households. How has this dramatic, sustained decline come about? Has it come about because we've got more personalised fire engines um, which respond more quickly with better firefighters and so on and so forth? Well, yes, some of it has, but most of it has come about through the spread of the smoke alarm, a simple generic piece of technology that virtually anyone can use and they can buy it anywhere, they can maintain it themselves, combined with a fall in smoking, changes in building regulations and changes in furniture regulations bring us about a huge decline in deaths through smoke and fire. So the answer is not fire engines, the answer is smoke alarms. What are we good at in the public sector? We're good at fire engines. We're good at responding in crisis with big resources. What are we crap at? We're crap at smoke alarms. So this is one of the problems when you're a politician or a leader so you, we need a new solution to this problem, and then the civil servants come along and say, we've got lots of fire engines, maybe we could make the fire engines adapt to this problem. Actually, what we need is smoke alarms. How do you disinvest from bits of the fire engine economy and reinvest in the smoke alarms? When will that smoke alarm solution work? 
I went to Leeds recently to look at what Leeds Education Authority have done with bullying. Uh, they had a fire engine in the middle solution, which was deal with it in schools, police in schools, wardens, so on and so forth, made no impact because most of the problem was out here. What have they moved towards? They've moved to a kind of fire alarm, smoke alarm solution, which is about peer-to-peer, -peer, codes of conduct, uh, people being uh, bully mentors and other things. It's about influencing behavior out here. So any problem you face, think, is this a smoke alarm problem or is it a fire engine problem? And if we need smoke alarms, how do we stop being offered fire engines? If you've got big private sector providers who are on block contracts, contracts providing you with fire engines for social care or whatever, how do you get them into these smaller, more distributed uh, solutions? Different way of thinking about it. <clears throat> Has anyone here heard of this company called eBay? Has anyone heard of eBay? Everyone's heard of eBay. <laughs> How many people here have traded on eBay? Oh, come on. There are ma many more people than that. have. 40%. How many people have traded on eBay in the last... Well, in 2008. What you've got to think is, you know, all this internet stuff uh, might be sound very highfalutin, but how many of the population of Barnet use eBay? And if they do things like this, or things like this, what does that mean for the way they think about the way that you operate? How searchable you are, how quick and easy it is, how they can get ratings of what you do from other people, how they can find out what other people have done, can they be part of a community that's interested in buying all this stuff? 1995, 122 people trading on eBay. 2005, 122 million people. So eBay has gone to scale by doing something really, really simple, which is just connecting buyers and sellers on a platform that is largely self-regulating. So the rating, 97%, the rating system came about because when eBay was about to go public, they thought they needed a complaint system to allow buyers to complain about bad sellers. So they created this rating system. They never imagined that it would be used to praise people. But when that tool got in the hands of the buyers, they started to praise good sellers. That meant good sellers built up a reputation. That made the market much easier for people to come into and spot the trustworthy sellers. That meant that the sellers got locked into the market because they couldn't take their reputation onto another trading system. That meant the whole thing gathered a huge momentum. What is it based on? It is not based on a massive eBay customer service department somewhere rating people. It is not based on off eBay, which goes out and inspects eBay sellers all around the place to give them star ratings eBay sellers do not have a best value performance indicator plan. What they have is a completely transparent peer-to-peer -peer rating system. So if you were prepared to move to an eBay model for services in Barnet, what would it look like? So that's the second tip, idea. Any problem you come across, could you think, what would be an eBay-style solution to this problem? How could we mobilize the intelligence of people in the way that eBay does?